So how about a big round of applause, warm welcome for Rukaya Adams and Mark Zussman. Hi, Rukaya. Hi, Mark. We're so delighted to have you here. I'm delighted to be here. It's a little nerve-wracking, but I'm glad to be here. Nerve-wracking? Yeah, you guys are smart. Really, really smart. And given that you deal with investors all the time, what does that say about them? Well, we mostly communicate through spreadsheets. So this is a little bit different. A little bit different. C can I? So there's a small weekly newspaper in Portland mm -hmm. that did a profile of you a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have my phone out here. And here are a couple of paragraphs from that story. In a majority white city, Rukaya Adams stands out. She's a black woman who has earned not just a place at the table, but the chair at the head of it. Quote, she's a lethal combination of independence and brilliance, says Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, who as state treasurer served with Adams on the Oregon Investment Council. To some of her numerous supporters, Adams is more than a financially savvy steward of the investments of huge sums of money she is also the person willing to use the megaphone that her professional position affords her to challenge conventional wisdom in the halls of power. And her ideas include investments to create social justice and rectify racial inequities, even while seeking top-tier returns. Quote, a lot of people who want to make social change get involved in politics, end quote, says Portland venture capitalist Nitin Rye. Quote, she wants to do it with money. So my question is, is that fake news? I have to say, hearing um, Rachel Monahan's thoughts or interpretation of, of what I say reflected back at me is really fascinating. I would say that I'm a traditional investor, and I happen to be a woman, and I have to happen to have the experience of an African American. And so I just talk about what matters to me in the context of, of my work. And, that sounds like social justice, to me it's just investing. Um, so it's been a fascinating experience to, to hear how what I have to say is interpreted, right? And, and then thinking about what I have to say to you today, it probably will sound activist. But really I'm just, I'm just doing me. So let, 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 let's step back for people who may not be fully briefed. You are the chief investment officer for the Meyer Memorial Trust, mm -hmm. which is, I believe, either the first or second largest philanthropic organization based in Oregon. Right. Fred Meyer, when he died, left his assets to the people of Oregon, and it's that the, 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 the value of the grocery stores and the land that they sat on that funded Meyer Trust. At the time that he died, it was somewhere around $200 million worth of value. Today, it's worth closer to $800 million, and we've given away $800 million over the last 30 years. And so your job is to not directly invest those proceeds, but choose the money managers who do so and provide some sense of direction. Um, partially correct. We do direct, directly invest some. So unlike prior CIOs, I have principal investing experience. So we manage about 140 million of it directly. Um, and then there's a small portion of that that's invested regionally. So that some of that is, is through funds, but some of it is direct investing. But a portion of that, you're giving, if you will, to VCs, who then turn we're, around and we're invest. In, we are investing in VCs, and they turn around and distribute it throughout the state. And some of our investments are directly in companies. Um, but we, venture capitalists are a very important partner right. in the work and, that we do. And, I think and my job at the trust is to make the money. I don't get the fun of giving it away, actually. And I think it's fair to say that you are, in essence, directly or indirectly, the largest venture capitalist in the state of Oregon? I would say, yeah, my sphere of influence includes some of the larger pools of capital that directly invest in the region, yeah. And then in addition, you have been appointed by Governor Kate Brown to chair the Oregon Investment Council. I was appointed to the council by the governor and elected by my peers to be the chair. At the beginning of this year. At the beginning of this year, yes. And the Oregon Investment Council has the responsibility for investing both state funds mm -hmm. and um, public employees' retirement system mm -hmm. funds. So anybody so who's a public employee in this room mm -hmm. who's hoping to retire is counting on you. Yeah, a lot of people think it's Mitt Romney or some dude like that back there. I'm like, nope, it's your homegirl back there. 
Making sure your retirement funds so are there. No pressure. <laughs> so, you know, in the profile in the Lambert Week and in conversations with you, you've made it very clear that return on investment is not necessarily the only thing that someone like you needs to start paying attention to, mm -hmm. um, as well as you think this is something that venture capitalists need to start paying attention to. Yeah, I think we need to think about the word return more broadly. Um, and, I, and I'm speaking today from my seat at Meyer, not from my role um, as the chair of, of, of the Oregon Investment Council. In my seat at Meyer, I get to explore ideas and in investing beyond traditional framing. And one of the issues we've, we've become, uh, become very clear about is that return is defined more broadly than just financial return, that we think about a wider set of stakeholders when we make decisions about returns, not just stock Holders. Uh, we think about returns in non-quantitative ways, and we think about ESG and not just the E in ESG, that's environmental, social, and governance factors. We think about the S, which is how, how are employees treated, what are the consequences to our decisions. And in exploring what return means more broadly, I've been doing some thinking about how we might pivot in particular um, to venture capital. So the risk when doing that is that you're not gonna necessarily generate as high returns as you would if you were simply focused on profit and returns, right? Uh, that's the conventional perception. But in my seat at Meyer, I've done quite well. Uh, our returns are on par with folks who don't have any constraints. Um, the numbers are what they are. We're top decile this year and top quartile for the last 10 years, last five years, so I think that if you are responsible, it doesn't necessarily mean that your returns are lower. It's harder, um, and your, your board and trustees and oversight mechanism has to be more robust, um, but it's possible. And if I'm a public employee, and all I'm concerned about is protecting my pension, mm -hmm. and as I'm sure most, if not all of you know, the public employee's retirement system is woefully underfunded, right. almost at a crisis stage, and in fact, the governor is either subtly or not so subtly putting pressure on you to bring higher returns. Mm -hmm. If I were that public employee, I could hear what you're saying and saying, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Right, so I want to be really clear about the two distinct roles that I play. At Meyer, I have a lot of free, a leeway to think about return more broadly. In the seat at OIC, I have one very clear fiduciary responsibility, and that is to optimize risk-adjusted returns for the beneficiaries, period. There's no ambiguity about that. And so the advantage, though, that both Meyer and OIC have in me being a person who crosses over the fiduciary spectrum is that we can at least have conversations about topics of return, risk and return. Um, Whereas for some CIOs, that's a difficult conversation to have. Uh, but but there, there's no ambiguity. In the job at OIC, I'm delivering dollars, period. So we're going to open this up for questions a, a little bit earlier. Um, I, do, I do have some, some things to say. Oh, go for it. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we don't have Oh, you have slides. To, I do have slides. But I, I would like to just say a few things and then have you interrupt me at a point where you have a question or... I know how to do that. Okay. And then I want to also offer to the audience to, to interrupt me at any point. If there's a question, I'm happy to stop. Okay. I spent many years as a lawyer and, and the, the lawyer process is to have a dialogue. So I'd rather not just yap on. Um, but I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me that sort of opened my mind to new ideas. Last year I was traveling, I traveled a lot for work, and this, um, the cover of this magazine caught my eye. I'm a, a middle-aged lady, I don't have children, so cute babies always sort of catch my eye. And uh, I read the um, story um, that this um, cover was about, and it was a story of a woman uh, fleeing S Syria. She lived in, in Aleppo, and as the fighting in Aleppo picked up, uh, she and her new husband decided they needed to, to make their way out of the city. And over the course of nine months, she walked from Syria basically to Greece. And I don't know if any of you know how far that is. It's about 2,300 miles. It's really far. It's as if she walked from Portland to Chicago and then got in a little boat and tried to, 
to cross the Great Lakes and make her way to Canada. I mean, that's the equivalent of it. As she was leaving Syria, she discovered that she was pregnant. So she made that crossing of the country on foot with a growing baby inside of her. She gets to Greece in a refugee camp, has a baby. The first time she sees a doctor is when she's giving birth, right? This story, as the story goes, and, and the doctor was trying to tell her that she was in trouble, the baby was in a different place, her placenta was breached, it was a really dangerous situation, they're talking to her in Greek, she doesn't speak Greek, uh, the baby's delivered, and she's sort of placed back out into the refugee camp. And when she ends up out in the camp, she has a baby that's having trouble eating, and uh, it's small, and so it's having, struggling to regulate its body temperature. And so what she did was what we'd all do. She thought, I better get my, hand on, my, my hands on a, hand, a handheld device and download some information from YouTube. <laughs> so she goes on a YouTube and watches videos in um, English uh, by somebody, probably, you know, some, some town like Medford, some parent, and she watches the video, figures it out, and she's able to, to keep her baby alive, to, to teach it to latch on and to keep it close to her body, to regulate its body temperature. And that story of that woman in the refugee camp really, really shook me. Because I realized as an investor, I wasn't asking enough of our venture partners that we delivered money and all we wanted back was money in return. But that woman in the camp didn't, she didn't need money, she needed information. And so I, I just started to, to think that if I have a chance to talk to folks in tech like, like I do today, it's rare that I get to talk with you one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, the thing I would say is that I want you to think bigger. Right. And I want you to expect more from me as an investor. And the thing that really kind of struck me about that experience with the woman in, in the camp was that I've been focusing on profits from products, more or less. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't really what her use was. She had this kind of profound utility for YouTube, which is entertainment for me, but she needed to save her baby's life. And that got me to thinking that I wonder if there's an asset class that we can break out from venture capital to be more about innovation and less about product-driven profit. Um, and I realized that a lot of the problems that are generated by my focus on profit, the buck sort of stops with me. Um, so, so this reading of, of, of the story and, and, and the, her profound utility and the outcomes halfway around the world got me to thinking about three things, and, and, and I'll tell you what those things are, and if we get through my other slides, and we get through them, if we don't, we don't. The first question that came to mind for me was, uh, did investors get what they wanted, right, in investing in venture capital and producing products like YouTube? She also used WhatsApp to communicate with her parents. They were stuck in Aleppo, and so once a week, her father would literally walk 20 miles to some place where he could get Wi-Fi and download um, messages from her telling her that the baby was alive, telling them that the baby was alive. And so they were communicating using these social media platforms and entertainment platforms that we use for beaver shots and, you know, naked pictures or whatever people use them for. They were using them for totally different reasons and it just got me to thinking, where are, we, where are we getting what we asked for? And then the next question is, I felt that the young technologists like the people in this room we're really delivering the most profound form of philanthropy for that young woman, right? Even though she was surrounded by the, the Red Crescent, the Red Cross, probably the United Nations, there are people trying to feed her, but none of those people could help her figure out how to save her baby. She needed, she needed the, the chain of innovation from the video uploading, the compressing, the cloud storage, the Wi-Fi device. She's probably in a refugee camp with some sort of um, battery system that allowed them to, to share the electric, electricity. This beautiful chain of innovation allowed her, mm. delivered a kind of philanthropy that we haven't been able to deliver in the past. And then the third thing that came to mind from that is that, that, that the increasing use of technology in our lives to solve profound issues, right, very, very human issues, is making the people in this audience the most important philanthropists in the world. 
right? That it's not, it's not what we thought um, from the past. So those three ideas were what I was hoping to talk a bit more about today. So I'm happy to talk about them in whatever order so you like. So one question, then we can open this up a little bit. I mean, your example of Syria, the, the woman leaving, going to Greece, mm -hmm. going on YouTube mm -hmm. and learning how to take care of her baby. Right. So when YouTube was created, I doubt they thought that was the intended. I, I mean, think I doubt they started with a philanthropic. Right, but I, you know, I wonder, so that's, a, that's an interesting point. I've seen in tech, in, in tech responses to this issue that we think, well, maybe if we had a different problem statement, if we had more diverse engineers, maybe the, the initial problem wouldn't have been how can I upload videos of me dancing in my bathroom. Instead, they would be how can I save my baby if I'm in a refugee camp. Right. Um, I, I, you know, I, th I think that is a, that approach is generated by me as the investor back there saying I want my money. And so what it does to the innovators is that they start to think about the monetization of the product instead of also taking the next step and thinking about what the utility might be beyond what they can imagine in their lives. And so that sort of leads me to the question, this is a picture of that lady, um, you know, what the heck am I asking for? as I stand back there. Most people think that the venture capitalists are the source of the money and that they drive the culture, but there's actually money behind the venture capitalists, right? They're very important and high paid intermediaries, but behind, I'm standing behind them saying, we need our profits, right? Because I have to deliver in order to fund our retirement structure. So that's a really hard uh, truth to come to, that what we're saying to our companies and to executives is, oh, you guys solved that problem, but I'm still standing back there saying I want my money. So right. if you were going in a room and a startup was pitching to a bunch of VCs, let's assume stereotypical VCs, and a startup says what almost every startup I've ever heard says, which is, we're here because we think this company is going to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Right now, how do most VCs respond to that internally? I mean, they won't say anything, that, but yeah, gosh, thanks do they for just sort of move past that and say, we're not of interest, or we don't believe you, or it doesn't matter to us, or what, I mean, what's no, the... No, that's a fascinating topic. Mark Andreessen has spoken eloquently on this topic, where he says that venture capitalists wanted flying cars, and what they got was 140 characters. And I can tell you that as an investor, I'm not thinking about flying cars or 140 characters. I was thinking about profits. And I can say that venture, uh, uh, companies and founders and, 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 and employees delivered what we wanted. But now I'm in this spot thinking, is that really enough? It's not enough. And so, I, you know, I, I, I am inspired by the talk in the future, but when the rubber meets the road, my responsibility is to deliver returns. Now, we've broken out some asset classes in private investing uh, into sub-asset classes in response to market need. For example, um, because companies have stayed private longer, a new asset class has grown in private investing, and it's called growth equity. You used to go from venture to public, to going public, right? There was a, a step that went to the public markets, but now we have companies that grow large private, and now that asset class is called growth equity. So I wonder, could we create a different asset class for businesses like Twitter that struggle to monetize their product, but they have profound utility around the world. I wonder if that asset class could be something like innovation equity or convergence equity. Could we drop products, businesses, ideas, technology into a different asset class that's Isn't that more asset class called nonprofits? No. No? We still want to make money, but then I, I think we want to give those businesses time and space to figure out what the model is and to think about utility and outcomes and not just monetizing products. Now this is a little crazy. It makes me uncomfortable to even be talking about this, but we're seeing, I see this question playing out in lots of asset classes that we invest in. For example, real estate. Uh, a lot of people have said the rent is too damn high, right? And the reason why the rent is so high is that I'm back there as an investor saying, look, we invested our money, we want returns. So we're putting pressure on markets to deliver returns and people would like us to intervene. We're seeing it in biotech because a lot of the compound uh, research and innovation is funded through venture capital and drugs are really expensive because I want my return. And so in order for, for those 
ideas, of the, the question of whether things can be affordable or thinking about the externalities to bubble up to the surface, then I think we have to evaluate the role that, that capital plays in driving the externalities that we see in our society. I mean, we all live in this city together. We see what's happening. The work we do, the work that all, that all of us do is connected to that. I think we're just getting more comfortable acknowledging the role that we play in it. Right, at least I'm, I'm finally getting comfortable with it. All right, should we open this up? Sure. Right there in front. Hi, thank you so much for your chat. And my question is about, there are fears that Portland and the Bay Area is becoming the tale of two cities. And wrongly or rightly, the tech community is, is blamed for this and the rise in rents. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how can the tech community take their innovation, energy, and money um, and really engage with the local community to, to challenge these social injustices? Thank you. Can yeah. anyone hear the question in the back of the room? Or do we need to restate it? OK. So, so Rowena, thank you for that question. Um, and here we are back at social justice. So the first thing I'd like to acknowledge is that I don't think it's the tech community, the companies, or the employees that are the cause. And it's, I think, in disingenuous for us to expect that individuals and even individual companies can solve an institutional problem that we've created. Now, do you create problems? Yes. Having high-paid tech employees come to Portland and gobble up real estate and change the lifestyle creates some problems, but you can also solve a bunch of them too. So I think that realistic view of, of the role that uh, tech businesses and the underlying products play in our lives creates this really unique moment that we can now move forward and say, look, you're gonna be important to us, I'm important to you, let's figure this out. But I will say that I don't think that asking individual companies or people to solve the social problem is the right approach. I think the right approach is to say, we have an institutional problem, we've got to construct an institutional solution. And to me, that institution is capital. And so investors like me have to be back there and be willing to acknowledge that even if we see on the retail level that housing prices are going up or that uh, drug prices are too high, if you follow the chain of influence all the way back to the source, it's usually the investor back there that's driving that. So I think we have to have real honest conversations with sources of capital about what our, how we define return and what externalities we're willing to be honest and take responsibility for. But it's a really complicated discussion. Now this is the other, the other part of that discussion, is if you follow the chain of capital back, in our case, let's say to a pension fund, then you end up kind of chasing your own tail because a lot of the capital that drives some of the problems that, that fascinate us and anger us and really frustrate our lifestyles is our own 401ks, right? Or it's, it's our own banking relationships. And so it's gonna take a lot of sophistication. I think we're all gonna have to come to terms with this question about what return means. And it's a really scary, this is a scary conversation for me to have. I'm a traditional investor. I don't wanna be talking about it but I can see that some evolution in how we think about investing has to happen. And, and, and the other step in this is to say to our creative class, you guys, tech innovators, that what you're doing, and the example of the young woman in the refugee camp really stands out to me is, she couldn't have used money. You've given her $100,000 that wouldn't have solved her problem with the baby. She needed your talent. And if that's the case, if your talent was the most important form of philanthropy for her, what has happened is the, the work that you do is now literally more important to us than any form of charity. That the products you create, believe it or not, are the most important uh, form of philanthropy. Now, providing access to, the, to those products can be charity, but the products themselves are philanthropy. Thank you. Right up front. Uh, yeah, I love the idea of creating an asset class where the desired outcome is maybe uh, benefits to just society at large. But how do you make that appealing to investors? Like, how do you 
I don't know, market an asset class like that so that investors see that and are like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my money in that. Yeah, one of the interesting things about investing that I didn't get before I was in it, let's say 20 years, <laughs> is that we think that with each investment, the investor aims to optimize returns. Right? That's what it seems like from the outside. But that's actually not the way it works. For a lot of investors, they do something called asset and liability matching, where they take uh, a bond, for example, that pays five, a 5% 5 coupon. Then they match it with a retiree who they have to pay a 5% coupon on their annuity. And they staple, the, staple them together. And that's called asset and liability uh, investing. Insurance companies, for example, do that. I think we could construct an asset and liability matching framework for assets other than um, fixed income. So I wonder if a company like Twitter, for example, needed more than five years or two years to figure out its monetization model, could we start to tie the returns from that kind of asset to a longer dated liability out there, right? Something like um, funding, road work that we know won't be urgent in year one, but by year five or 10 infrastructure investments, we might need the capital for that. So I think the thing that isn't apparent to most outsiders is when you get up to $90 billion, what you're doing is actually just matching cash flows from assets to cash flows from liabilities. And so we just need to think about the asset classes in a different way, right? Venture capital has been hard to tie to an asset class in investing because it's so unpredictable, it's so hard. You don't know what the hockey puck will look like. You don't know when you'll deliver. So it's been an asset class that we've taken out of that asset and liability matching framework. But I think if we can de-risk the assets that sit in the class, we may be able to match them to a liability in the long term. And I think that way you get much more capital in the asset class. This is all crazy talk, by the way. I've never had this conversation before. I'm just sort of thinking on the, off the cuff. But I, I do think we can do it. And this can't be the end of our evolution, right? This, this can't be the, the stopping point. I don't know, I just feel like there's got to be, out on the horizon, there's got to be some new way to think about how we deploy these trillions of dollars um, with the aim of taking better care of one another. Question? Way at the back. Uh, my name is Mata Zapeta. Thank you. You're not crazy at all. Um, I think you're visionary, and I think that what you're describing is exactly what we need. Um, this idea we're starting to form around it, it's the notion of zebras instead of unicorns. Um, so if you're interested, there's a manifesto we recently wrote called um, Zebras Fix What Unicorns Break. But um, my question to you is, there are values that are implicit when companies are built, and from that, those values, the funding model and everything else follows. So when you think about the values of these companies, what are the values that you want to see embodied? Mara, I read your piece on Medium on zebras, so I took that in, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, you know, I think that the, the first is that we have to think about sustainability in a different way. So, so not just like environmental su sustainability, but social sustainability and how we operate our businesses. Um, I think we have to disregard geographic boundaries um, in our companies. We know that these are global businesses and that someone halfway around the world may be using your product. Um, so I think thinking about geography and nationhood in a different way is really important. Um, and then I, I would also say that um, we, we think a lot in technology about disrupting, but I, I think I would add a value of being more generative and, and contributory. And somehow in the design process, in the problem statement, in the business model, that you have to add those, layer in that expectation um, to businesses. It sounds like a lot, right? It sounds like, like new expectation, but what I think it is, is us leaning out and saying, where can we go from here? We've already defined a model that's extractive, that focuses on profits over um, of utility and outcome. We've, we've already created a system where wealth is extracted and distributed in ways that probably isn't sustainable. So the question is, what's the next, how can we re-gear the system to 
enable us to support one another and to live together over the very, very, very long term. So Mara, that's what I would add uh, in terms of values, but I may have to reflect a bit more on that and have another conversation with you in the future. We are unfortunately out of time. So Wakai Adams, everyone, thank you.